let's um, get straight into it, shall we? Um, I'm going to start with you, Katie, if I may, as um, a retail expert, a retail giant, I think it's fair to say, uh, in the circumstances, as well as with your, um, your huge footprint within racing. Um, Winfred made reference to um, how robust racing has been over the course of that pandemic crisis, really. Um, but our economy, our world economy, gets buffeted around all the time. We're certainly feeling it at the moment. I've been looking over the course of the last few days as interest rates are rising here in Australia again, fears about uh, mortgage increases, the pressure on the retail sector there as well. So um, what do you think that means for racing now? Are you, can you be as optimistic and uh, encouraged today as perhaps uh, Winfred's figures suggest you might have been over the last three years? I love that I get such an easy question. <laughs> right. um, so for those of you that don't know Harvey Norman, we're in eight countries. Um, we employ 20,000 people. Um, through COVID, I was dealing with eight governments. So for all the issues that you think you went through racing, with racing through COVID, there were a lot of consumer-facing businesses that had much bigger challenges, actually. Um, but we were able to take the experience that we had with our Harvey Norman business into our racing business. So with our racing business, we have a lot of touch points. Um, we're breeders, we race, we own a race, we have an auction house, um, uh, we're a marketing company, and um, I think the racing industry coped really well, as did a lot of industries. But, you know, there's a lot of questions, and Winfred's spoken about them. Um, a lot of people think that that great result that everyone, a lot of people got through COVID is the new normal, and it's not. Right? The world's going to come crashing down. It's already started to come back. One of the statistics that was up on screen was talking about the youth and the amount of money that they were spending um, betting, they've got apps, etc. In a lot of countries, actually, those young ones that were earning 400 bucks a week suddenly got $750 a week, whether it was furlough, JobKeeper, whatever. They were sitting at home, and this was a great way to use that money. So how, in that case, do you attach those young ones to the racing industry, or was it just one of those things because other sports got that money as well. So if you think about um, what we do, and you know, I look at the big picture. I, I, I'm not siloed. And what we continued to do and continued to work on with Magic Millions was how do we give the consumer an experience? So you are not siloed. How do you bring more people into the industry? How do you get young ones into the industry? How do you make it a global sport? Um, my, my critic here on the right, Eddie, will, will tell you what I got right and what I got wrong. He's very good like that, and I'm happy <laughs> for him to do that. Um, but, you know, you would have seen that we introduced, prior to COVID, polo, and through COVID, show jumping within our week which is authentically about the horse, has to be about the horse, but we're bringing in people that are already about the horse. And how do you um, use equestrian as part of the greater conversation around what happens to horses after they're finished on the race, racetrack, for example? Um, so, you know, and and I'm going all over the place here because there are so many points that Winfried has brought up. The show jumping was a huge success for us this year. We had 5,000 there um, to watch this great event. But if you're going to say thoroughbreds can then become show jumpers, you've got to get the grassroots of show jumping going. You've got to get people back into show jumping so that it becomes a great national sport. You grow the sport that way and they become integrated into 
this bigger market that we're talking about, the same with polo, the same with eventing, the same with dressage, actually. Um, from a global perspective on the brand, we not only do the show jumping and um, polo, on the Tuesday morning before the barrier draw, we do the race on the beach. I'm not recommending this, but we did get good coverage when we lost two <laughs> horses. I think um, the German coverage was best. We lost two horses on an autobahn, and um, I didn't know we had autobahns in Australia. Um, but, you know, that race on the beach has become phenomenal globally. We go to the Barrow Drill, which is on the beach, the auction house, the race day is phenomenal. Um, but in, in every part of that touch point where we, we're marketing this industry, we're doing it to the general public. So yes, you've got um, the wealthy, you've got mainstream, but you know all of the activities that we have for that week or that 10 days is bringing the general public to it. The race on the beach, thousands of people, and they're all families. You know, the people in this room know um, that I'm just passionate about bringing families into this. It's not one demographic. Um, you know, Vin Cox every year has this great party through Magic Millions Week, and this year we were there, 50% of that room, and he has a lot, right? He's very generous, a couple of hundred people. 50% um, were under 25. And I'm looking at these young ones that just love this industry, they're um, passionate, they've grown up with their parents in the industry, they're educated. I'm actually really, really positive about the future generation coming through. Um, just one last thing, um, and it'll come up later. I've just been in Silicon Valley for the week. Chat GPT, you will know, right? I was with um, Google as Bard got launched, I was with TikTok looking at meta reels, looking at YouTube shorts. Um, whatever you've seen with social media and digital up until today is gonna to change totally from now. So we'll be sitting here in 12 months time going, oh my God, look where it's gone. So you actually have to be on top of this. We're a tech company as well. Harvey Norman's been into, into tech since 1990. Um, I'm there all the time keeping up to date, it's really important that you don't say, leave it to somebody else, you've got to be involved. But there is a game changer that happened last week, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out with racing. You set yourself up for this, because I'm going to ask Eddie what went wrong in a moment in terms of what <laughs> Magic Millions has done. But can I just ask you this then? From all you've spelled out there about encouraging youngsters in families, not possibly non-race goers, where is your conviction that they will now be gripped by the sport and be held to the sport? Or actually, they'll, they'll, enjoy, they'll enjoy a bit of fun on the beach, but that's as far as it goes. Was that to me? Sorry. No, that was for Katie. Oh, sorry, I thought that was for Eddie. No, so, say no, that again. I, Eddie will give you a list in a minute. <laughs> 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 I'm so used to Eddie taking over. Say that again. Sorry. So where is your confidence that the people you're drawing in with these innovative, exciting, fun events as well, um, whether it's on the beach or the autobahn, that actually they're not just there for the day, they're, not, they're gonna stay, they're gripped. They're, you've, you've but you can see it, anyone them. that comes to our week, right, is just so excited about what we do. We keep innovating, we, t we keep adding. Um, the really good thing about this is, um, you know, Jerry and I have got a checkbook and we use it, and if I hate something, I change it. <laughs> Right? There's no panel discussion. Jerry just follows what I say. You know. Jerry says, Kate, whatever you want to do, that's fine. Why, why am I not surprised to hear that? No, but, but it's, you know, as you, a lot of you sit on boards, etc. I know you're jealous that I can make that decision so quickly. Um, uh, but the, um, the whole industry has, has always had a great opportunity to do what we're doing and um, we see ourselves as being very fortunate that we can do what we can do and others can follow. You know, you should use us as a lead. But one of the, um, one of the points in, you know, how you get more people into 
this racing industry. Our daughter is a show jumper. She's in Europe. This is a career in Europe. It's not so much a career here, so we need to get that going, and that comes back to how you attract talent. And you've, in, got, the, you've got scope there as well, potential. In, as exactly, well to work right. There's a huge opportunity yeah. for this country to get back there. Okay, but, Katie, thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to throw on, if, I, if you don't mind, Eddie, you, so you, you see the pluses and minuses in... in uh, what Katie's achieved. Well, I think uh, Katie was being a bit self-deprecating because backstage before we came out, I said to Katie, I thought the Magic Millions was absolutely magnificent in the way it lent into what PR people would call a disaster. <laughs> so when the horses got off and ran down the street, it went around the world. When we saw Katie's horses running down Surface Paradise Beach, it was absolutely magnificent. When the heavens opened up and a race meeting was cancelled and then rescheduled, it just showed that this was something that people wouldn't give up on. And as a result of that, I just saw so many positives coming out of it. And in some ways, what Winfred said uh, in his amazing dissertation, I think we should give Winfred a, another round of applause because it was just yeah. fantastic. Because for the first time in a long time, I've seen an organisation, I'll say industry, because I'm going to come back to that word in a second. I saw an industry look at itself and say, right, OK, we need to move, we need to have a go, we've got some things going. Katie has been able to do that with her magic millions. But the first thing I'd say is we need to get away from that word industry. In here, call it an industry, go through the bedding and everything else. What we have to do is go out and talk about a lifestyle, the lifestyle of the horse the lifestyle of the strapper, the lifestyle of every person in there. And I would lean into one of the greatest things that racing has that no one seems to mention, and maybe because I'm a little bit to the side of racing, and that is it is probably the greatest sporting organisation for gender equity going around. Whether it's the Phillies, whether it's the Mayors, <laughs> whether it's uh, uh, Jamie Carr, Anna Melnesium, you've had people like Gay Waterhouse, you've got people, entrepreneurs like, like Katie here. You've got to all sorts of people coming through. It is one of the most egalitarian sports, even though it is always pitched to the toffs, if you like. And there's a real opportunity. Thank you for that person up the back. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, I won't interrupt you. But, uh, <laughs> but this is where we can get into it. And that's where, I don't know, David, you want to ask me about documentaries and things. And, and yeah, Drive to Survive is, you've got to be careful because sometimes that's just lightning in a bottle and it hits a zeitgeist. Where I look at racing at the moment is, racing only has to go back to its own history. It was racing that invented, the Melbourne Cup Carnival invented the birdcage and corporate entertaining in this country, long before football or anyone else even knew what it was. These things that the, the organisations, you know, even Ian McEwen reinvented the Cox Plate, which was at that stage was a, you know, it was a race, but it wasn't anything really spectacular. Then it became a focus. So I, I look at the documentaries, and what you need to do with documentaries is get documentary makers in to do them. Don't have them as, I'll use the term, industry pushed forward. Don't have the organisations who, who get on, because organisations want to have good PR. Good PR is not good entertainment. You know, Drive to Survive works because of the friction. Um, I did a show called The Footy Show back in 1994, which revolutionised AFL football and then NRL up in the northern states. Mm. And the reason why it succeeded was the only successful sports show ever in prime time, until now you've got the front bar on Channel 7, is because it was everything away from the industry. It was the excitement. It opened the doors and let women in to what happened in the locker room. We found out that the people who actually were the proponents of these great skills also had a sense of humour, or could sing, or were stupid or there was controversy, and you got them up and you saw them at their weakest moments, you saw them at their greatest moments. But one area that I think everyone needs to look at is the four biggest half hours of television every night of every week in this country is the first half hour and the second half hour of Channel 9 News and Channel 7 News. Every hour on every radio station, it is legislated that you have to have a news segment. The only sport that actually is going in in the mornings to get on breakfast radio, the highest and most important part of a radio station is racing. Get on the news. Get on the news. Today's Herald Sun doesn't have a racing story in it. Has it every other day, and that's not a, 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 the Herald Sun. It's quite the opposite. The Herald Sun absolutely supports racing like you wouldn't believe in this town. But there's, all, there's opportunities, and not PR, not commercial-driven activities, 
but actual news that, that and make is, stars. That is really throwing a gauntlet down there, isn't it? Because you're saying get, get on the news means, well, I mean, I'm in news. I know what I want on the news. Yeah. And it's not another lovely story about a, a horse winning a race. It's the seamier side of life. You know? it, it's it's getting it's, to the truth behind some of these stories. So it's very bold to say you've got to push yourself out there, warts and all. Yeah, it is. And, and let people talk. You know, that's the thing. PR is great, except everyone knows that everyone knows the backstory, and it becomes the backstory, and then it becomes a best-selling book down the track, and anyone does a movie about it. But in real time, I'll give you an example. We had a, an agreement with a, a major industry figure in the I'm using industry major racing figure uh, last year. A controversy happened. Manager got involved. Stopped this straight away. By the end of the year, when the the documentary would have been finished, that person had become a superhero again. It would have been one of the greatest documentaries going in sport. But it got stopped at the first hurdle, the first, we have to be careful, the first PR, the first, oh, we could be cancelled moment. You've got to lean into these things. People talk. When, you, when you're sitting watching the news, you're sitting there sometimes, it's when they go, news break, a breaking story. And you go, shut up, everyone, and you lean forward. <laughs> We've got to get racing to be leaned forward again. I think if we're going to break through these areas and get the attention of young people, because as Katie said, it's going to be happening on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. YouTube, TikTok, TikTok especially, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and whatever is invented in the next six months. Mm. Yeah, and every every element is on TikTok, yep. positive and negative. So you've got to be certainly up with it. Thank you for that, Julia. I mean, I think um, you know it's a it's a difficult sell, isn't it? Racing at the moment. I think in the UK it's a hard sell. What? What, what can you do? What do you think you need to do? Is it about changing the product? Um, can it just be changing the perceptions? If you look at how, not just today's customers, but the future customers, um, and we're going to be hearing a lot of evidence about this over the next few days, how they consume sport, how they want to behave, and. Um, I think we're really well placed. I don't think we need to change the product. We know that young people like to consume short bursts of really entertaining sport. So who better than racing is well placed to, to deal with that? You know, they don't have the attention span for a 45 minute half a sport. So I, I think we're really well placed. I think a lot of the challenges how do we make that connection with them and how do we, how do we present it? And understanding um, that next generation and um, you know, really interesting what, what Katie was saying there, how many uh, people within our sport have got that capability in their management teams about technology and how do we communicate and connect with that next generation? And understanding the barriers, understanding why they aren't connecting with us. Is it about you know, the perceived expense? Um, I know that there's been a huge amount of work done um, in, in people like the UK Jockey Club removing some of the barriers around dress code. Um, you know, yes, it's a social event, people like to dress up, but you don't want people thinking, oh my God, am I allowed to go? So I, I think we don't need to change the product. We need to remember it's a sport. And, you know, it, there'll be lots of sessions around wagering, but people find their first connection and love with the sport um, through the horse and through seeing those top athletes compete against one another at the top of their game. And so we, what we must ensure is that those pathways for the best horses to compete against the best horses and all the stories and all of the possibility around giving fans that behind the curtain look. Um, uh, we, we need to make sure that we protect that. It's interesting you mentioned the, the dress code and, and you know, bringing it down a notch. I mean, a lot of younger people are gonna, has it taken this long <laughs> to tell us what we can and can't wear to go to an event? I mean, how far behind are you? But, but a lot of that is perception. You know, actually you can go racing um, most days of the year in most enclosures. In, in whatever you're comfortable in. But th there is a perception that, oh my God, because I've seen pictures of people in top hats, uh, that I'm not allowed in. 
Well, we've seen all sorts of pictures of, uh, of race goers at, at big events at, at home, not all in still with their top hats on. But, but it, it's <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, it's true. So, you know, it's, that's the way it goes. Um, it comes down to a large extent, I guess, then to innovation, as we've heard from Katie, ways in which you can achieve that. Um, Martin, what, what is the role, do you think, of innovation? What is the, how far can it go? We've seen across, um, certainly Victoria, around Australia, very innovative new um, events, new meets, uh, and they are clearly driving a lot of interest. Yeah, well, I've, I've been asked um, probably a hundred times over the, the eight years that I was racing minister whether I thought innovation was a good thing, and it was always seen through the prism of, frankly, the competition between Victoria and New South Wales. And, I mean, I think it's... You know, if, if you look at Winfrey's presentation, it's undeniable that innovation is crucial. It's very, very important. But it takes many, many forms. I mean, if you, if, if you look at the challenges confronting racing, um, the need to attract more eyeballs, the need to um, maintain our social licence in a very different environment, the need to attract young people, um, the need to have um, more ability to attract wagering dollars, sponsorship dollars, government support. Of course, you need to innovate. Um, uh, but you know that innovation can be. Uh, it can be like the magic millions. It can be new race types. It can be better use of digital platforms. I mean, I I laugh every year when I see the media controversy about free-to-air viewing numbers for the Flemington Carnival. I mean, I'm one of the. I'm one of the strongest racing fans I know. I, I don't watch racing on free-to-air TV. I watch it on my phone or on my iPad because I'm not generally planted in front of the TV um, when, when the races are on. So I think we need to understand what we're talking about. Um, I think we need to think about innovation in terms of how you attract non-traditional communities. Um, I know in Victoria there's um, a view amongst um, culturally and linguistically diverse communities that whilst they might bet um, going to the races might not be for them, it's about the way we market the product. It's not just about um, throwing more prize money uh, at already cashed up owners. I think that concept has a shelf life. Uh, and I think if you look at the challenges that Winfried outlined, um, none of them, the, the answer to none of those challenges was law of the jungle competition. Um, the answer to those challenges is about more collaboration. So I think you need innovation within the, within the structure of collaboration, and that's not just national but international. Uh, and you need to appreciate that there are certain strengths and pillars of the industry, and I'm not just talking about the Caulfield Cup, Melbourne Cup and Cox Plate, but I'm equally talking about the Stradbroke and the Railway Stakes and the Golden Slipper. Those pillars need to be protected and there needs to be a lot of innovation around them, whether it's about attracting younger uh, race fans, whether it's about ensuring that um, our animal welfare credentials are unimpeachable. You know, and I think something like a global standard for the WIP rule would be incredibly beneficial, both in terms of perception uh, and in terms of our ability to attract a new audience. Um, so I think innovation is important, but we need to be clear what we're talking about. It's not just about one thing. It's not just about you know, new races with more prize money. It's about all of those ancillary things. You know, how we entertain our customers, how we use our facilities, um, what new types of events we put on, uh, how we think about animal welfare, how we attract a new audience. The, I mean, the positive side of innovation is when you see the, su the success that comes with it, but it does mean that in Australia, you've got races which are new and exciting, and they're not even group one. They're, they're overtaking some group one of, uh, events in terms of the, the public perception of, of what a great race or meet uh, it might be. Is that a problem for you? Well, look, I think, I mean, um, there are probably people in the breeding industry who would have a, a better sense than I would about um, the importance or otherwise of, uh, of black type. I think it's still pretty important to people. Um, but the, the important thing is I think there is a pathway towards some of those new race types being group races. Uh, but again, that pathway lies within um, a collaborative framework rather than a law of the jungle framework. So, um, Goto San, if I could come to you on, on that point really about the pattern and, and whether it is even still relevant and in connection, as, as Martin was saying, to breeding. Do you think it's still relevant? Does it still have a role? 
I believe that the importance of pattern laces will remain unchanged forever for thoroughbred racing. Thoroughbred racing consists of many factor stages, breeding, breaking, training, and racing, and the equine value chain created by this is extremely important. In other words, racing should be an indicator of breeding and this is the reason why bloodline has been so important in horse racing history. In order to promote celebrate racing and to make it root in, into society, it is necessary for racing authorities to draw up the ideal structure that should exist and to make as much effort as possible to achieve this. I think that it is very important to develop a racing system that is easy for racing fans to understand through a clearly defined pyramid structure. Given that, Winfred, um, how important is it to keep that framework then? Because we've seen what innovation does. Innovation is exciting. It seems to move the sport along. You're talking about trying to attract newcomers, retain them. Uh, is the pattern still purposeful? I personally believe there is not a necessary contradiction. I think innovations, and uh, probably we can address the elephant in the room if you talk about the Everest. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a great innovation. It is, in my view, works only in Australia, where you have this combined with the breeding industry, take a stake and create something new. It had definitely a space where you had, even if you look at a pattern, where you say a top class group one race for sprinters fits in the overall structure. But if you look at horse racing quality control, and this is not internally, we have 30,000 uh, 30, race horses in Australia. If you assume now 3% are group one, that gives you 900 horses how many group one races you can have. And if you create too many events who take away from the sporting highlights, where you want to have the best horses competing against each other, you dilute the sport, you dilute the quality, you dilute in the end even if you look at the wagering side, because as soon as the field size falls below, below eight, six, seven horses, the revenue is not there, but I, firmly believe the fans want to see the best horses competing. Mm. So there is space for innovation, but you have to do it in a structured way. And in the end, racing is a selection process for breeding. And one, if one says no, every, every race is a good one race, you should have a certain quality control. Again, I personally think you can do both, but you have to protect what are key assets the, club, the, the sport has. And not because I'm in Melbourne, but I, a race meeting around the Melbourne Cup is a race which has global relevance. Do you want this innovation jeopardizes? And there are other races. So in the end, it comes back how we grow the sport, not fighting it against the other. Permission of innovation has to be given, but we have to do it in a structured way. And this is why the pattern is there and why the pattern enables a discussion. What is good for the long-term sustainability of the sport? Peter, you've been uh, listening with magisterial patience, so thank you very much indeed for that. But I want to come into this, this whole point, come back a little bit to it, about the post-COVID era, because it did fundamentally change a lot of people's attitudes to going out, to going to events. And even if they're not afraid of going to them anymore, they've lost the habit possibly a little bit. So how do you overcome that beyond the, the I won't say odd innovation, great innovation here or there, but, but to start getting that consistent throughput again? It, it, it is true that COVID broke a lot of habits and people don't have not automatically uh, across the board reverted to their old forms of entertainment and recreation. Um, this is especially so in live theatre, but for outdoor events and sports, generally crowds are holding up, but they're somewhat more discerning than previously, we have our hardcore supporters and race, race attenders, of course, uh, but you could lose 10 or 
15 to 20 per cent if you're asleep at the wheel. And the great thing about us, we've spoken today about collaboration from Martin and, and Unity, from Winfred. One thing everybody in this room agrees on and throughout the industry is we want crowds at our races. There's nothing more dispiriting walking onto a race course on a good day's racing only because we, we know uh, what a great sport it is and what a spectacle it is and we, we, we don't want people to, to miss out on it. I personally feel a failure every time I walk onto one of the ATC courses on, on a group day and there's a, uh, a smallish crowd. But I'm glad to say that overall in Australia at least, we are keeping up our crowds. But everything that we've spoken about till now and that uh, Winfred highlighted means we've just got to redouble our efforts. Um, data and digital. Katie's touched on this as well. Data, we've, we've got to understand more about our race course uh, goers and the public and here at the ATC uh, we've invested in a C CRM system like many clubs and uh, business associations in pu uh, public facing uh, consumer relationship management and here we're assembling uh, the data, uh, the background, age, preferences of our customers, we're surveying them a lot. Uh, look, it's a long journey, it's a never-ending one. As Katie said, in, a, in 12 months' time, we might look back and think we were dinosaurs or troglodytes um, on dealing with the public, but we, so that we can communicate with them more directly. B because our biggest challenge is w we welcome all comers. Um, as, as Winfred said, uh, that uh, fi uh, 55, 43% of our, our participants are over the age of 55. Um, so they have to be approached in a different way. If we can direct our attention to them by email or post or old media, newspaper advertisements and, and radio and free-to-air, all the better. So we're investing heavily in that. Uh, there's a lot of privacy issues. You've got to get their consent. Then you've got to safeguard it with cybersecurity. Heaven forbid if there was ever a, a, a data leakage. And the other thing is digital. Already touched on, it's self-evident in that uh, the young, young people want everything through, as has been said, Instagram and Facebook and uh, increasingly TikTok, YouTube and so on. And, and we've got a great team of young people who do it, um, tailored to uh, what young people want. A, a lot of it's social. But the more, more and more we're pushing the horse, the thoroughbred appreciation of, of the sport. And then finally, you've got to have the facilities for them when they, when they arrive. You've got to give them the right experience, stating the obvious. Uh, we're doing more and more surveying as they leave the course, net customer satisfaction. Uh, the longer, longer queues for the bathrooms or the, the bars or the food uh, outlets the less likely you are to get a good rating. Um, but, but you, you've, and it's hard because as race clubs, we're not flush with funds. We've opened the, in partnership with Racing New South Wales, um, the Wink Stand, they largely funded it. And it's just a game changer. It's, it's, it's world class, it's luxury for the public. Uh, and we've now got a policy of keeping our admission very low. We're only $40 on, Everest Day, which is our marquee event. So it's a multifaceted approach, but essentially the bedrock of it is data, digital, and race day experience of an exceptional kind that will get them to return. And, and take on the chin some of that social media commentary then. If you're talking about queues at the Louvre, for example, I think in the UK, Julie, last year, it was the price of a pint, wasn't it, at, uh, yeah. at Aintree or whatever. Um, but where, Eddie, where do, where do the broadcasters fit into that in terms of social media? How much sense of responsibility uh, do you have to help drive that, that side of the interest in sport? Well, it's a good point that uh, uh, what Peter said there about the... You've, First of all, to get people there, because what you have to do as a broadcaster is we want people there because they're part of the whole set. Yeah. You know, the crowd makes the excitement come. We saw the racing under COVID when there was no one there, and we saw it when it's, it's full of people. We know which one we want to have. And Peter's point, we have to get more of the driveway to driveway experience for people going to the racing, because I think a lot of the barriers are 
are there before you even get to them. Once you get the races, it's great. It's actually getting there. How do you get on the train? How do you get a car park? Everywhere you go along the way, people are saying, no, 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 you've got to be a member, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you're not dressed properly, can't do that, your mates can't come in here, queue up to go to the racing, you want to have a bet on, you haven't had a bet before, the bloke behind you is trying to get on and uh, yelling at you to hurry up because there's two minutes before they jump somewhere, etc. It's a, it's a hassle. And particularly for people who are not imbued in racing traditions, and even more particularly, I feel, for women. And it's interesting, we, we've got some applause about uh, bringing down the dress code. From my experience, when you lessen the dress code, everyone wants to dress up. And uh, you know, so it was like the, uh, when we're in COVID, as soon as you said you, you only had two hours a day to train, everyone trained for two hours a day. Now you've got 24 hours a day to train, no one gets off the couch. It's, you know, so as, as soon as you actually take the barrier for entry away for people, they get into it. To your point though, and going back again to uh, one of Winfred's uh, slides, David Hill is one of the greatest television producers in the history of, of, of in history. He was the guy who was the producer who turned World Series cricket into what it was for Kerry Packer. He rejuvenated Premier League soccer, uh, the NFL Monday Night Football for Fox. He's a, a driving force, pardon the pun, behind Drive to Survive. He's a great mate of mine, and we're discussing this. And one of the things that TV needs to do for racing is, is be the catalyst for the blockbuster. You know, we have wall-to-wall -wall racing every day, and if you want to have a punt and you're in there, you're like Marty, you're on racing.com or, or whatever the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, platform is you want to get to, whether it's your phone or whatever. But on a blockbuster occasion, so what's happened in wor the world, and to Winfred, Winfred's point, eSports has become massive. Now, when eSports came on, I think the first one we had, we, some of us here are old enough to remember Pong. Remember that when you had the two things going up and it hit it back and forth like it was table tennis? Their ambition was to turn esports into looking as real as possible. The next generation have lived through that. What we need to do as broadcasters is turn the broadcasting of sport, but particularly racing in my opinion, into it looking like a video game. So you need to have things like, I mean racing, it's a funny industry at times. It's called racing, yet we never know how fast the horses are really going, or whether it's a record. Or, you know, you watch the swimming, and who cares who's swimming up and down? You put a yellow line there and say there's the world record or a Commonwealth record or the school high school record and everyone's up on their feet. So there's ways of turning racing into something important if a broadcaster tells them it's important. Again, it's what I call lean in. You know, why you know, has it, it taken so long? Well, I don't know. I think it's the traditions because I think racing was so far ahead. Now remember, don't forget, we were getting 120,000 to the Melbourne Cup in the 1890s when there was about 300, 400,000 people in Victoria. And sometimes the, the traditions, I think again, Winfred said and maybe even Katie has been living proof of breaking traditions but holding the things that are important. Not, not vandalising it, but taking it to a new level. I think Jean-Claude Cocteau said something that if, you, if you're able to take something old and make it new, that's a poet's work. The rest is prose. And that's what we need to look at. Even I look at commentary, for example, on the big days. As Martin said, you want to hear the commentary going around? You can watch that on, on your platforms. But if you're a once a year punter and you're watching the Melbourne Cup, for example, why wouldn't you have Bruce McEvaney or somebody as a special comments person who can say, right, here it is. We've got with 5G, you mentioned 5G before, 5G, 6G, every horse will be able to have where it is in the race, whether it's racing up or it's slowing down the sectionals, all those types of things become betting prospects, but more importantly, exciting prospects. Where's my horse? It's actually five wide. Did you know that means he's going to run an extra 150 metres in the Melbourne Cup? You know, hello to Shane Dye if you're out there from Caulfield. But, uh, <laughs> um, those type of things, and I think that's where broadcasting needs to be. Again, not just having locked off cameras in the stands. Get shots back into the stands when the racing's coming through. And we shoot at an empty paddock most of the time when all the action's happening this way. One quick example before I, I, I pass on. This year, I was lucky enough to host the Melbourne Cup Carnival. What is normally the dead end, literally, of the carnival is the final day, stakes day. It was turned into Champions Day. The last three races, for me as a broadcaster, were as exciting as anything I've broadcast. And I've done everything from Olympic Games to Grand Finals to uh, uh, Super Bowls, etc. 
we turn the cameras around. Instead of going out, which is traditional, to get the jockey as they finish, and again, you're at the middle of nowhere, we got it inside, and we saw captains of industry, footballers, all these owners jumping up and down, and the joy of racing permeated right through. Gay Waterhouse, one race, it's hugging, everyone was there. Everyone seemed to be friends, because we actually turned it into a party in the mounting yard. Then we went out to the jockey. After all that, my two sons, who are the demographic we're after, 19 and 20 years, 21 years of age, all they wanted for Christmas was to be in a syndicate. Right. They wanted to be part of this. They saw it and thought, how unbelievable is this? And it wasn't necessarily the prize money, it's something that's obviously there, but having three races in a row for $3 million at Group 1 with horses that we all knew going head-to-head -head against each other and making it something really spectacular and as close to prime time as possible, yeah. turned this into an event. Really and congratulations to the VRC and, and Racing Victoria for being able to pull that together because it turned a moribund part of the day, the, the limp over the line, if you like, in the, in the Melbourne Cup Carnival into something sick. Just absolutely sensational. We get that, that would bring us neatly on to issues of syndicates and ownership. But Julie, sorry, you wanted uh, no, to... No, it's just something you said there that, um, about you know, what would make a great broadcast product. And, and it just struck me that one of the barriers to that is that fragmented nature of our sport that Winfrey talked about. Um, you know, Drive to Survive, Formula One, single owner, what's that, what they say goes, some of the stuff that Katie was saying earlier. Mm. Um, but just to, to make something quite simple, like sectional timing, let's make sure that the broadcaster it, it says it's, impor it's important, so we're all watching for the world record. You need everybody working together for the trainers to allow, um, that chip to be in the saddle cloth, you need the jockeys involved. And, you know, that collaboration that Martin was talking about earlier and, and recognising that we've got to work as one to, to make that exciting broadcast product. It's, it's the blockbuster. Yeah. You've got to have blockbusters. I mean, there's a, there is a great book I recommend for anyone. It's about 10 years old now, but it, it, it still works. It's called Blockbuster. It was written by a woman who was a Harvard graduate who went into sports, media, movies, and worked out where it all goes. And Disney changed their business plan. In the old days, they'd have you know, 10 or 15 movies a year, spend 10 or 20 million on it. They decided, hang on a second, why don't we go big? We'll go, we'll get Robert Downey Jr., pay him a fortune, put him into this superhero category, get all the merchandise around it, and throw $150 million at the marketing of it, and make $2 billion. And, and then it goes. Then after that, that feeds the rest of everything. If you want to have art out movies, if you want to do the rest of it. And, and I think the, the industry part, where you've got to have racing every day, and you do, you churn out the sausages every day. Racing here, crossing there, and it's fantastic. But on the big events, you've got to tell people it's big. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens in, in some of the battles we've had over, whether it's the Everest in locally, you know, the Everest, and you know, the Cox Plate wants to move, and this is that. We didn't celebrate the fact that we invented a ripping hour and a half of, of sport and entertainment on that last day because everyone started to look to how they could cut each other's lunch. Yeah. Let's celebrate, focus in and go bang and you'll get people. You'll get on the back page of the Herald Sun every day. The, the people will become interesting and you'll actually have something that you can sell and people will celebrate. To Katie's point, people want to be part of a community and then they'll come to the races. Well, let's get into that issue because um, you know, we're talking about making the, the sport more attractive to, especially to youngsters, you've given a great example of your, your boys who now want to get engaged in owning a little piece of this. Um, so we'll focus on ownership for a moment if we can, because that feels to me as a relative outsider, one of the most conservative aspects of racing. You know, you've got the big owners up here and it's for their pleasure and everyone else is sort of cascades away from there. How do you change that? That seems to be one of the real challenges to bring a, a new uh, element into uh, racing and into ownership. And Goto-san, if I can start with you, um, because the JRA has some initiatives in that regard, what have you done to, to appeal to the next generation of horse owners within the JRA to get them into the sport? I'd like to say that to be a horse owner in Japan is, in a sense, a kind of status that requires a certain level of financial assets and income. It means that not everyone can be a horse owner. The JRA promotes ownership to this segment 
of the market by active, actively targeting the wealthy in public, publication, and also by tie-ups with mega banks, credit card, card company, and urban developers, holding partners at risk courses for the wealthy, and introducing trainers as needed. These activities have been effective in appealing to the wealthy class. To appeal to a broader share of the population, the GRA allows registration of the syndicate club corporation that receives in-kind investment in less horses based on an, an anonymous partnership contract. This form of ownership has been very popular in recent years as it allows racing fans to become part owners without having to meet the financial requirement of an individual owner. For example, in the case that the purchase cost of a horse, 50 million yen is divided among 500 people. It makes it possible for each person to participate with a thousand yen investment. Through the, the experience of this syndicate system, the number of people who developed into registered individual horse owners has been increasing. Right, so, so it's beginning to permeate through. Katie, what, what are the, sort of the untapped opportunities, do you think, in terms of ownership? And uh, how many can own a horse? Who should be, who should be coming in? How do you arrange it? Um, you know, syndications in this country, um, we've done a really good job. And if you go back to our initiative around women 10 years ago with the yeah. racing bonus, the extra half a million dollars with our two-year-old race, that really was a game changer in the world, not because of syndicates, but because um, it was quite obvious we didn't have enough women as owners mm. in our industry. And the other um, game changer there was how we were portraying women in the industry 10 years ago. So it ticked the boxes in a lot of ways. Um, our winner of the two-year-old race this year, Skirt the Law, was owned by, or is owned by, 40 women. They paid $170,000 for that horse and they took home $1.75 million. Um, part of that was the women's bonus and then we put it into the three-year-old race as well. But Eddie is right. Um, his sons are now looking at a share in a racehorse. And we say to people, don't buy one, buy a share in five horses so that you can actually, with your mates, be following it every week. So one share in one horse won't do it as far as I'm concerned. But, but for contemporary society, what a great way to get them into this industry. It's always been in the past the cost of owning that horse as an individual, so this defrays the costs enormously. Um, if you could have seen those women, right, bringing in that horse in January and telling their husbands to stay in the stands, right, <laughs> because the blokes always want to join them on the, on the dais. Um, but, but that's actually underway in this country. So you just push it as hard as you can. It means that you're bringing the general public in as well. And can I get back to what Peter was talking about? So in this industry, you've got to talk about the ecosystem, right? If you say that you're going to build a brand on a mobile, you're gone. You've got to get them to the races. You've got to have a great experience because that's your brand. You're telling people what it's about. If you come to our race, you're there on the track, you smell the horses, right? You see the horses, you see the jockeys. Um, we can't get anybody, you know, physically we can't get any more into that racetrack because it's a small track of 25,000. Um, but when the camera on our day goes across the crowd, um, we get great ratings on the day. Um, but through our telecast, we have great content as well. So there are a whole lot of things that come together to make this a great sport, and um, syndications is one, that coverage and that content is the other, and that then goes into your social media, totally. actually. Julie, you were, you were nodding vigorously over 
as micro ownership, however micro micro is. Um, is that going to grow? Is that going, that's here to stay, presumably. Is it going to grow? I mean, you can see the appeal. And how micro does it have to be to still get that sense of ownership? I absolutely, it's just common sense to me that it's absolutely a growth area. It's more affordable. You know, people don't buy a boat overnight with having never been on one. So it, you, you give the people the opportunity, particularly young people, to experience and, and hopefully progress up up that ownership pillar. It's been a growth area in the UK in terms of syndicates. I mean, as far back as 2013, we started really seeing the, the syndicates take off. And I think micro ownership is going to be a, a, a huge growth area. I think one of the, um, you know, going back to, to the integrity threat, uh, we need to make sure that that is a well regulated part of the market. That in, in this country, obviously, the, the, your equivalent of the Financial Service Authority is interested and um, is seen as, <coughs> as controlled by the government. But in other racing jurisdictions, that's not the case. So we need to make sure that um, if people are putting their hard-earned cash in, that we're not going to be faced with a, a big story that, you know, more shares were sold than, than were available or, or people being ripped off in that space. That's really interesting because that brings into play other issues of integrity. Let's say, you know, what, what, do, what do the general public make of racing and why would they want to be a micro owner of a horse yeah. when they see a horse being whipped every time it runs in a, on a track, for example? Do you, have to, do you have to address all these things or do you have to educate? What's the, you know, what's the challenge? I'm, I'm, How do you break the barrier? Katie used the word ecosystem. Taking a, a holistic approach, I think, is really important. Okay. Um, let's move on to how you pull all this together, because a lot of you have talked about holistically and working in unity. Uh, that means government, which I think to great effect over much of COVID, racing was one of the success stories, if that's the right sort of phrase to use at a time of a pandemic. But Martin, perhaps we could start with you. You have so many, as we've heard over the last hour, different elements within racing, different stakeholders. The frank, let's be honest, different factions uh, at play here. How, does, how do you, or did you work at pulling all that together? How, how do you get them all on side? Well, you need to have, I think if you're, if, if you're a government minister for racing, you need to have a pretty keen appreciation of the complexities of the industry. And as you say, um, that's not just about your principal racing authority, it's about the clubs, the trainers, the jockeys, the owners, uh, and the employees within the industry, the broadcasters, uh, and everyone else. I, look, I think racing and government works well together when... Um, the two sides, if you can describe it that way, have an appreciation of each other's imperatives. Um, so from um, you know, a, a racing point of view, um, I think the industry expects government to appreciate um, that racing is a major source of employment, that it's a major source of economic activity, whether that's um, just through the spend that happens around a carnival um, or the tourists that come um, to, to, to a major event um, or, or indeed um, the broadcasting and global kind of reach opportunities that racing creates. I, I think government needs to understand that racing is a holder and a keeper of um, the nation's story and its history and its traditions um, and the fact that racing, uh, uh, you know, apart from that um, is a, a, a really important pastime and diversion that hundreds of thousands of people enjoy. You know, government needs to appreciate all of those things, and I think that's differentially the case um, in various jurisdictions. I think some governments understand that better than others. I think for the industry, it needs to understand the pressures that are on government. Um, you know, there is not a bottomless well of financial support that can be provided. Um, when things go wrong, whether it's an, uh, an integrity issue, an animal welfare issue, um, or, or any other kind of scandal, it's often the government minister that finds themselves answerable for that. Um, and so racing needs to be careful not to try and put government in that position. And I think government would like to see... I mean, I know... Um, let's take the, 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 the whip rule as an example or, or animal welfare. I've always had the view that you've got to take control of these things. You know, be the catalyst for change rather than having it imposed upon you. 
Uh, and so I think, you know, to the extent that racing understands that it needs to grab hold of these issues and manage them and control them, rather than allowing them to become problems for other people, um, that is something that is well appreciated by government. I think the other thing that's... We've been very lucky in Victoria, and I think this is the case around the country. Racing desperately needs um, bipartisan political support. It's not enough um, to have the government of the day on board because racing does have the potential to always be a political football and a hot-button issue. And if you've got whoever's not in power um, deciding that they're going to kick the racing industry for some political advantage, um, all of a sudden racing will be, you know, in some kind of deep trouble. So, and I think the industry's been very good at ensuring that it has bipartisan support across the political spectrum. That's not the case necessarily with some of the minor parties, but, you know, you can't please everyone. Um, and, you know, and I think moving forward... The, the, the principal thing government is going to want to see um, racing appreciate and act on are those issues around social licence. Um, that, that's not to say, as a minister, that I would expect the industry to pay undue attention to that cohort of militant animal activists who are never going to be persuaded, um, because I don't think they're necessarily good faith actors. But there is that huge swathe of the community that is persuadable uh, and it can't be left to government to do that persuading. The industry's got to be actively um, working with that part of the community that's persuadable, um, demonstrating not just that they understand the talk, uh, but they are walking the walk in terms of making racing a more attractive proposition for that cohort. Right, that's, that's quite a good sort of um, game plan to follow. Peter, how, what would your tips be for unifying these various stakeholders if they want to turn to government for help? There's probably two, two approaches to government relations to, to address that, David. The first is, and this is often overlooked by businesses or sports, you need a long-term strategy. As the old saying it goes, you can't fatten a pig on the way to the market. You've got to invest in building relationships over a period of time in the absence of any ask of government. You invite ministers, their, their personal advisers, government officials, to the extent uh, probity will allow them to attend race courses or events associated with your club. The heavy lifting on government relations will always be done by the regulatory bodies, but we've all got a responsibility especially at club level, uh, to support them in this. And it doesn't matter if you're a metropolitan club or a regional or country club. You should be interacting with all levels of government. And politicians are very responsive to this. They want to be seen out and about amongst their voters or constituents. It's an easy ask, but you've got to be patient because one day the balloon's going up. And, and for us at the ATC, we, uh, local government is critical to us. Um, because we have a, lot, uh, a number of uh, traffic issues, noise issues, as well as planning development considerations that it's no exaggeration to say uh, will amount to hundreds of millions of dollars, if got right, in conjunction with the state government planning authorities. Very much the way Caulfield and Mooney Valley and Brisbane Racing Club have developed surplus land. So, look, you may not, see, you may not need the politicians and the officials for some years, but you're, except for local government, which I think you'll probably need on a regular basis. But invest the time and effort. Uh, don't be strangers. Uh, they want to build a, a level of awareness and uh, trust. The second thing is, of course, issue-specific. And here it's very nuanced. It's, it's got to be quite a multi-layered approach. Essentially, it is, as Winfred said earlier on, and I'm glad in my heart to see him put up government relations as a key uh, need for our industry. Um, you have to address the issue on an economic basis. But if the minister or the government knows you, trusts you, understands you, you pitch it in terms of employment, benefit. And as Martin said, and many businesses don't get this because they think it's uh, them one side of the table and government the other, you've got to understand the pressures or needs of the, of the government. It can't just be winner takes all. 
Um, I've been involved in a number of industries, and by understanding what the government needs to get things through the parliament or to be able to fund it, you've got to give a little, um, in my experience, and, and they will appreciate that more and be more endeared. So look, just take, just afford government relations the highest priority and invest over a period of time. And when it comes to an issue, uh, think very carefully about how you present it and do so on the basis of economics to the greatest extent possible. Thank you for that. That's, that's two sort of government perspectives, if you like. Uh, Guto Sam, can I turn to you as a, a very experienced racing administrator who wor worked for many years with government? What, what for you are the key elements in establishing and have been the key elements in establishing a, a, a strong relationship with government? Uh, to begin with, JRE is a special corporation fully capitalized by the government and established under legislation, making it a public entity. The JRE is under the supervision of the government and has special gambling exception for racing. This means through transparency and fairness are required of all JRA activities, including me. <laughs> <laughs> While there may be some cases where such a legal framework feels rigid, I think that it is effective to maintain sport integrity and public trust. We have established a good reporting and communicating system with our government and the flow of all information is extremely smooth. I think that this well-established framework is the reason why JRA was able to maintain nothing without any suspensions, even during the pandemic. Thank you very much indeed for that. Let, let's um, just come on, a, we haven't got that much time, so I want to into a couple of other issues, one of which you touched on, or we touched on, Julie, and, that, and it comes down to the social acceptability of, of the sport. And we mentioned the whip or the crop, call it what you will. Um, interesting time for you to come here, and we're very grateful, but as the, your own reforms are in the pipeline in the UK, how far do you have to go to find that social acceptability? I mean, our, our new rules came in on Monday, but it's not just looking at, at the crop in, in a regulatory framework. We're looking at it as part of a, a whole suite of activity around horse welfare. And, you know, we have a, a, a strategy on horse welfare called A Life Well Lived that goes all the way from breeding through its racing career, aftercare through to end of life. And, and that will cover things like pre-race trot-ups. It will cover things like... Um, safer obstacle design and you know the the, the whip rules are, are just one area and um, and i think martin mentioned um social license and and that's why it's important that you, you've had this sort of unspoken bond of, of trust with the general public and and if, if any there's a, a world horse welfare paper on the, the subject of social license and, uh, and I would recommend it to anybody um, in the room but it, it, its conclusions are is that you've got to you can't be in denial um, that you've got to embrace and be proactive about working in this space um, it's hard because we know that a, a lot of our fan base or our future fan base it is now less connected with the rural economy, they're more urbanised, you know, all of the things that Winfried talked about in his, his speech. Whereas those who work with horses are saying, it's not a problem, you know, nothing to see here. So we, we need to make sure um, that we're proactive, that we're authentic, you know, and that it, it's not just seen as we're doing something at, um, for positive publicity. So. That, that's very difficult to achieve, isn't it? Oh, when, hugely. as you know, within, I'm sure within this room as well, there are plenty of people who say, this is not a welfare issue. Yeah. Uh, full stop. So we shouldn't pander to the demands of uh, outsiders just because someone doesn't like the look of what we're doing. It's not a welfare issue. So uh, it's but a the perception. Uh, the reality is, though, I mean, we do a huge amount of research um, and just... Some research concluded last year with um, 
not just those people who come racing, but those people who don't come racing. And one of the top reasons they give for not coming racing, 35% um, of them think it's a cruel sport. And then if you look at 18 to 24 year olds, that goes up to 45%. So it's not just that it's the right thing to do, the reality is if, that, if that's what those 45% believe, we need to work hard so that the, the images that we're showing through broadcast, uh, those, those moments that cut through from the racing fan onto the news, that we're, we're making sure that we're leaving people with the right perceptions, which is that you know, everybody who works with horses loves them. Um, and, and we need to be working hard to make sure that those stories are, are getting through to the general public. Eddie, as a broadcaster, losing the whip or keeping the whip, does it make any difference in, a, in viewing figures? Oh, I think everything Julie just mm. said, I've uh, underlined three times. And one of the things, there's an old saying in uh, disc jockey land, that uh, when the disc jockey is sick of hearing the song, the public are hearing it for the first time. Mm. And so what's happening is you do get people who are legitimate in their desire for the, the welfare of the horse. The term whipping straight away makes people blanch in the first instance. If you said it was controlling, that it actually was uh, integral in, in helping the animal get around in a safe way, that it's almost like having a Formula 1 car without having an accelerator and a brake, it makes sense. But if you say, oh, they have to use the whip, but all people in, in, in that particular area of life, and particularly young kids, they say, well, all of this is it's, so you can win the big prize money, you know, organised crime are, you know, helping, you know, they just want to launder money, they want to have, you know, the horses are getting doped up, et cetera, et cetera. What we as an industry, if we want to go back and use that term again, need to do is get rid of the industry thing, get the lifestyle thing back, but also explain. So, for example, the Melbourne Cup had uh, a lot of problems because international horses in particular were breaking down. It was devastating. You go to the Melbourne Cup and all you'd want to make sure is that the 22 horses got round. Subsequently, though, in the last three, four years, the introduction of the MRI machines, finding hotspots in horses, um, a, a trainer like Danny O'Brien, who won the Melbourne Cup with Vaughan de Clare, and then found out it had, had gone amiss, kept the horse out for 12 months, came back last spring and won a, a Group 1 race. They should, that's the celebration, and what we don't do is celebrate that enough and show. So, I mean, I would be showing all through the build-up of the into major races, the machines, the vets, I'd have far more women doing the discussion about it and putting the women vets up because people do see old male and pale, stale, you know, corrupt men, they've been in it forever and all that sort of stuff. Get the women out there more. I think that one of the biggest openings of people's minds in racing has been the amazing uh, propensity now to see far more women commentators on broadcasts. It has made a huge difference. It's softened the sport. It's taken away that chainsaw of bloke after bloke after bloke after bloke talking, that type of thing. And I reckon that's where we need to get into. There's nothing wrong with actually pumping up and getting on the forward step on what the industry's doing for husband, uh, animal husbandry. I think it's too defensive because it's always said, oh yeah, but we need these things. Things were wrong. It, it, it was cruel in some instances. There are shitheads in every industry who will let you down, who are corrupt, who are no good. Every industry. Yeah? School teaching, yeah? all that sort of stuff. You had to bring in things to stop teachers belting the hell out of kids and all that type of routine all the way through. But you get it to a position where it's right. And I think the racing industry is really finding that position. But I'd, I'd be out there singing at the top of my voice all the new things that are coming into it. You know, MRI machines weren't heard of 10 years ago. There's a new MRI machine that's going to be launched mm. in this city tomorrow night, which I declare an interest I've, I've got to, uh, I'm involved in, which is 20 times more powerful than the last MRI machine for humans. <coughs> now, that'll come to the racing industry as well. So we, we've got to show that we're doing, we're investing, and that the horse is sacrosanct. That that's what we need to your do. positives, basically, and uh, not hide behind them or get them out there, get the stories get out there. Get the story there. out there. Um, Katie, uh, you were talking earlier about women in syndicates and uh, raising their uh, involvement in the sport. Just, I mean, it's one of the big issues, I know, and I'm afraid we're short on time now, but getting more women into racing through at, at every echelon, how do you do that? Um, very quickly, back to what 
Eddie was talking about. So we launched um, as Harvey Norman Women in League 15 years ago now. And that was the start globally of not just getting women into the sport, but broadcasting, making sure that when you turned on the television or looked on your phone, you were seeing women. That went through AFL, went through soccer, cricket, um, and then into racing. Um, so having that visibility of women is very important, but also having the visibility of women running the businesses, right? If they're in the um, business of buying a horse, that they're seen buying the horse, making the decision on the jockey, etc. So it's not just racing that this whole piece of work, body of work's been going on for a long time, it's all sport. And so um, I'm really proud when you look at women in racing now and you look at the fabulous jockeys, you look at the trainers, you look at the owners, the administrators, the, um, um, just the, um, the fact that women thought they weren't welcome in this industry, but they were always welcome. It just needed that conversation to start, and that started with the syndicates as well. I think we're on a really good trajectory. Um, with racing, you think of um, the work that's been done around those young women coming through on broadcast, fantastic. You just need to keep doing it. You keep your foot on the pedal. You don't take your foot off the pedal and say it's all done. Um, but that's why it's important for people like Julie and I to sit up here today and give our point of view so that it doesn't become just the old pale white men sitting on boards, <laughs> right, and making decisions. But I've got to tell you, I'm now a pale white old woman. I just realised. So, um, and so I you've think got to get you rid sit of me on a board well. of one. As well, <laughs> Yeah, keep the, keep the foot to the floor yes. is basically the message. Katie, thank you for that. I would just add, of course, there are other diversity issues um, to address within racing. We will be doing that in our session on the future, which comes on Friday, and I think it's important to make that point. Um, we are up on the clock now, though, um, so can I just say to uh, all of our panellists, to Winfred, of course, for your presentation initially as well, uh, to Goto San, Julie, Peter, Martin, Katie, and Eddie everywhere, Thank you very much indeed for your contributions. Scott Hoster, a great start. Thank you. Thank you.